All right. Top of the hour. Welcome, everybody, to another installment of the Talented Learning monthly thought leadership webinar series. Uh, now going in our fifth year uninterrupted. Today's topic is Get Partners Hooked, How to Rapidly Deploy a Partner Learning Management System Successfully. And we're going to talk about that all day today. We have, like all Talented Learning webinars, we are loaded with content and we are going to uh, keep it moving fast uh, and, and furious the whole day here as, as we cover this very important topic. It's going to be a 60-minute session. We've got three polls. We ask you to please respond. Please submit the questions in the question pane, and we'll either answer them in line at the end. We have some built-in time, or we will uh, follow up individually with questions. Uh, if you're interested in CAE credit uh, for this, just contact me, and we'll uh, get you your certificate uh, for today's show today's webinar it's uh it's a production like a show perhaps uh, everyone but the learning objectives today are the the path that we're going to go guiding through is we're going to introduce you into the concept of partner learning uh partner being a broad term that encompasses as you'll see many many uh, different terms and, and uh, types of uh, organizations or individuals but organizations that aid your organization in one way and so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the business case of a partner LMS. We're going to introduce the concept of a partner life cycle of everything from how to attract to onboard and, and so forth. We'll talk about the partner life cycle and how learning content and a learning management system can impact each area of that. We're going to help you think through uh, what you need from a functionality and from an integration standpoint to reach out from your employee LMS now and support uh, your, your channel audiences. Uh, we're going to talk about in, an important topic of where the content comes from and how to think about making content uh, or coming up with content for your partners. And throughout all of today, uh, we've got real world examples uh, sprinkled in so that we can kind of reinforce what we're talking to with uh, what's actually happening uh, with real organizations. So uh, a lot to cover in one day. We are recording the session and we'll get you a link to that in uh, our repository uh, after uh, today. Uh, I'm John Lay. I'm the CEO of Talented Learning, who is producing this uh, uh, webinar today. Uh, we're now in our seventh year. We're educators, researchers, and consultants that study the learning systems marketplace. And we publish a blog, a podcast, this monthly webinar, white papers, and lots of other content freely available. Uh, to uh, uh, the public so that they can get smarter about extended enterprise uh, learning and so uh, including channel learning and so I had founded Talented Learning to talk about uh, and to report on extended enterprise of which a channel and partner learning is, is a big part of that and the reason being is all the way back in 1996 when I got a master's degree in instructional technology the very first job that I got coming out of college was creating content uh, or I was working for a content company that was creating channel learning content for high-tech and telecom providers like SAP Compaq and Unisys. And at the time, we were creating high-end video or interactive CDs and sending them out on CDs and VHS tapes. And uh, all the way back then, organizations realized the value of, of training, training their, uh, their uh, partners and channel. And so we'll talk about why today. Uh, but my 20-some uh, year history inside of learning technology has always had uh, partners as, as part of the focus. And I'm here today uh, with two experts from Docebo uh, that also uh, think about and work in uh, channel all the time. Uh, Craig Gleason is the director of partnerships, who's going to be, uh, well, I'll introduce him in just a second, who is in charge of partnerships for a platform or a software solution that helps you support partners. So. That's just a, a just a great perspective we'll bring in of the actual alert, uh, channel perspective. And then we have the product marketing manager of Docebo, um, Matt Powell, uh, who's uh, going to really provide perspective on just what Docebo is doing in this area and, and how that impacts uh, all, all the things that we're talking about today from a feature and functionality and from a practicality standpoint. So, Craig, introduce yourself, please. Yeah, thank, great to thanks, have you John. Here. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. Uh, yeah, so as you said, uh, Craig Gleason, I currently uh, manage partnerships at Nochebo on a, on a global level. So that's anybody who 
you know, integrates with our with our platform, resells it, or uh, implements it in in, in one way uh, or another. Um, I it, this topic's you know close to me for a number of reasons. One is you know not just being somebody who has who who works for an organization who who has technology that supports some of these important initiatives, but it's something I live and breathe you know every day. And and my background in partnerships like yourself doesn't extend. Uh, just at Ochevo, it's actually a business I've been in for uh, about 20 years in technology in various ways, managing uh, ecosystems of partners that contain, you know, uh, thousands of partners to to dozens. So um, I'm looking forward to to the discussion that 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 uh, we get into. Great, great. And when uh, Craig's not thinking about channel partners, he's remodeling his house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Matt, can you introduce yourself, please. Great to have yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, John. I'm really excited to be here and hello to everybody that's on the on the session today. Um, yeah, I'm an ex journalist turned content marketer turned product marketer. I've been doing this um, in the enterprise learning space for almost three years now. Um, it's a fascinating world. Uh, I learned a ton. Um, and my my focus mainly now is understanding how um, how our product is is supporting different customers um, in that partner channel and kind of across all of our use cases um, and how they're being uh, successful um, in their among their different uh, different success metrics. So it's it's a really fascinating world. I'm really excited to be here and 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 be talking about it today. Awesome, awesome. Well, while you're there, why don't you introduce us to Docebo for those that don't know you? Yeah, sure. So um, be hard to find Docebo, anybody that doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've had a good couple of years. Um, so the table's mission really is to redefine kind of how the way enterprises learn by applying new technologies to the traditional corporate LMS space. Um, so we've developed a, uh, a really easy to use, highly configurable and affording learning platform with kind of affordable, with uh, with end-to-end -end capabilities needed to train both internal and external. And I think that's a really unique um, unique situation among the, the vendor market in the sense that we're able to, to satisfy both sides of that coin. Uh, we are a publicly traded company, um, supporting more than 2,000 customers uh, and eight and a half million uh, learners worldwide um, across four different offices. Of course, everyone's at home right now, but we do have uh, a presence in in Canada, in uh, Athens, Georgia, in Milan, which is our our uh, kind of headquarters, as well as London. Um, so we have over a thousand organizations using Docebo to support um, extended enterprise training, and and, and more than a thousand. Uh, using Docebo for internal and external training, so it's it's, it's a really exciting um, a world to be in. All right, great, yeah. great. Well, thank you for that, and we'll get going. So we figured the best place to start off is to really just give you a quick market overview or an overview of the the channel and partner space, and we'll start there. We'll paint the picture from a high level, and we'll drill down. But before we go, we've asked this uh, survey question. Let me go ahead and launch that uh, three times now uh, here. Uh, in, in the last three webinars, uh, just about the, the COVID impact. And so we're gonna have speed polls here. Go ahead and uh, answer real quick. And uh, But COVID has impacted our training business in the following way. One, it's no training business, whether that's L&D or whether, whatever your training business is. Has there been no change? Has it revealed that you had way too much exposure in live events or brick and mortar events? Uh, has it, uh, have you been asked to uh, support more audiences uh, or learners virtually, kind of like what today's about, partner audience, or have you ramped down your training efforts or something else? Go ahead and, and, and give that an answer. Uh, as it turns out, uh, oh, wow, look at this. We'll give you just a couple of more seconds, a couple more, a couple more. Uh, when we asked uh, the average of the last uh, few times that we've asked this same question, we had 63% of organizations uh, say they are being asked to, to share more audiences. Uh, look at that for you folks, 82% uh, of the audience today. So uh, what are those audiences? Uh, well, a lot of times those audiences are partners and those audiences are our customers. And so we're gonna talk about the partner side of the equation today. Come back in December, we'll talk about the customer side uh, in, in more detail. So uh, let's hide those results. And uh, that surprised you at all, Craig, Matt? Yeah, no, not not surprised in the least. No. Um, I think I think we're experiencing it ourselves, and you know, even even across our customer base, we we kind of hear it all the time. 
Yeah. How about it? Yeah. How about it? Well, why don't you uh, start off, Craig, and uh, introduce the topic here? Go ahead and tell us what what this actually means. What's part of the training? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I think that that we're guilty. You know, organizations are generally guilty of of um, not understanding what kinds of training needs to to be delivered to our partners. But because our you know, partner universe is so can can be so diverse, and I know we break that down a little bit later. Um, you know, anything that we do to 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 train our internal organization, we need to do with our partners as well. So, you know, there may be particular processes that they need to to be educated on. They certainly need things like product training. Um, you know, as often as as organizations are revving you know, whether it's software product or releasing, you know, new products into the market space and how you're, what channel you're delivering that to, to, to the consumer, you know, there's all these things in between. Uh, what do you do for, for RMAs or repairs? How do you get support? You know, n never mind also being able to ask questions about, about certain things. Um, you know, there's, we're never going to hit it all on the mark all the time. We can even talk about, some of the requirements that are coming in for responsibility of compliance. So, you know, partner training, um, it's really almost everything we need to do that we do for our internal organizations. It's it's not a lot different. And, and as much as we feel we need to rev that for our internal organizations, we need to do that for our partners as well, especially if we, you know, have certain expectations or agreements on, on what will, you know, what needs to be delivered. So, you, you know, if you want an effective channel um, that's going to pay the dividends for both organizations, you know, take everything you're doing inside your organization and, and realize that you have to extend that out as well. So it's uh, it's a soup to nuts um, endeavor for, yeah. for anybody. And even now, it, uh, more so than even 20 years ago, the, the concept of partners for all aspects of your business are... Uh, are, are more realistic, you know, almost nobody does everything themselves anymore. So yeah. it's, uh, uh, it, it's, a it's great, important yeah. to, to share that training out. Yeah, it's that. a great point. I, I think organizations are becoming more decentralized, you know, as we go forward. I think, you know, the amount of third parties that are involved in our businesses today is is massive. More More than 10 years ago, far more than it was 20 years ago, you know, we have dependencies on on companies to help help us run our orgs um every day and mm -hmm. uh, i don't see that that changing I, and in fact i think it's going to grow even more yeah definitely definitely all right well so we're going to train our partners what do we need you know what's needed for partner well first you need some partners i guess that's the obvious one but it's not so obvious and we'll, we'll talk about that why in just a second you need a measurable business case of uh how you're going to measure success in this so there's one thing about extended en enterprise or external learning or partner learning or customer learning that is consistent throughout all organizations is that you have to tie it back to the actual business of to dollars and cents of, of how you're making an impact on the business with this training. And as it turns out, it's pretty easy to do in in uh, channel and partner training by just comparing those who have and who haven't uh, completed certain training events or certifications and comparing that against their uh, their performance. And you need a learning management system. Uh, to do that. Uh, maybe right now you're not using a learning management system. You just have content for partners up uh, in, in a website or an internet site of some sort. Uh, so that is certainly a, a way to do it. But to get to the measurable part, you need a learning management system to know who has or who hasn't uh, consumed that training at, at the very least. You need content, and we're going to talk about that today. And you need a PRM, a partner relationship management uh, sometimes that's a CRM, but generally a PRM integration uh, that is different than something that you would have inside of your employee. And so we're going to talk about each of these uh, areas as as we go through today uh, to to help uh, identify. But there's many different types of partners, and every organization uh, has partners. So very commonly, you'll hear them referred to as the channel, like the sales channel or external channel, or it could be value-added resellers or dealers or franchises, you know, franchises or independently owned McDonald's or so forth. It can be your manufacturing reps, your suppliers, your subsidiaries, 
Uh, it could be global subsidiaries in, in different areas that are operating under your name. It could be agents like in the insurance industry or retailers or service providers in general uh, that uh, you know will install and maintain and sometimes host, for example, your your service. Even like associations, professional and trade associations have organizational members that are essentially partners that can resell content or uh, act as partners. So there's a a, a ton of different partners inside a, uh, in every given organization and every organization uh, every organization has partners they just you know may not uh, know about uh, you know 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 about them or know what they're called and so just to give an example of that Craig you just ran into one recently uh, why don't you tell that story of, of uh, yeah the, the government it, yeah I, I think just to add you know to what you were saying it, it's you know we could call them suppliers we could call them third parties, but I think anybody that helps run uh, the operation of our business um, is going to, is, is somebody who could be considered a partner and benefit from, uh, from, from getting some kind of education or some kind of training from us. So I think that, you know, that, that's the way to think about it, but, you know, just to be specific about something I, I, I ran into or encountered um, a little while ago related to that the government was intervening on and that was specifically around compliance training so we know compliance isn't getting less around the world and you know it's we probably have new compliance um, training that we need to provide to our to our organizations you know years ago it was socks and you know now we're up to privacy and and it just seems to be be new things that we need to manage but what happened in particular in the the oil and gas sector was that these operations that are you know massive in size, whether we're talking about a Chevron or a, or a Hess or a Husky oil, they they employ a lot of third parties to help keep their operations running. And uh, you know they could be they could be service people, they could be salespeople, they could be downstream. But in this particular case, it was the maintenance organizations that they, one of the maintenance organizations the employ and, and a few years ago, the government had had decided that they were going to make the organization accountable for its suppliers to have compliance training. So now, you know, if you were a Chevron and you hired a third party and somebody got, heaven forbid, got hurt on the job, it was now going to be the responsibility of, of Chevron. And, and that's not a real case, by the way, I'm just using examples. They, uh, they would be accountable for, um, for any of the liability uh, for that third party not having the training that they need. So, you know, you, you need to consider that in, in compliance. You know, if you you're, you're have third parties working in your, in your buildings, in your facilities, there's a, there's a um, an accountability that you're going to have to take for people being in there, whether they're in your employees or not. Mm -hmm. um, what that led to ultimately was, you know, these organizations setting up systems to ensure that that their third parties had the compliance that they needed to be able to go on site, do the work, have an understanding of the work that you know that what they were might have been fixing or servicing at the time. So that had a whole fallout to it where now those organizations know who their certified suppliers are they know they're educated they can push them new training at any time you know so it's uh it becomes uh something that lives and breathes on and on and it's not always just to check the box and the the benefits can can be be very good uh for you from a process time to to again covering that compliance perspective so you know, some some good came out, and some some very good came out of it just from being able to manage the compliance side. Mm -hmm. Good story. It's a no matter how hard the LMS tries, it just can't run away from compliance. Even now, <laughs> next, even now in external training, it, yeah. it's all the all the same. I, th I think the key point that we're trying to make here, as as we progress uh, today, is that you know, as L and D, uh, a lot of L and D professionals, you know, maybe you've known that you wanted to support a channel or a customer. But there's always something other to do, you know, and you haven't got around to it. You know, I find in, in our business as consultants, we find a lot of organizations in, in that bucket. But in the times of COVID, you have to understand that every one of those people that are responsible for those partners are struggling inside your organization. 
Now, maybe a small organization, you know who those people are, a big one that you don't. But now's the time to go find those people because just as an organization that's that's trying to get through the other side uh, of uh, COVID in general, uh, the business sustainability is so important. So you don't want these different factions or different groups all trying to figure out what learning management systems are, recreating content from the ground up and doing things on their own when you could proactively go out, identify these partners, no matter what their name inside your organization and use that same content that you have uh, to help reach those. You know, that's, uh, in my theory, that's your responsibility right now to do proactively. It's not something that should come to you or it's an opportunity to do it proactively and really make an impact in your business. And so what industries are doing that? Every industry uh, in mind, but some do it certainly more than others, uh, you know, pre-pandemic and, and you know, a lot of organizations are focusing on it now, especially uh, that great majority that uh, had that too much exposure to uh, instructor-led training. But Matt, what do you see in, inside of your organization from um, which one of these industries uh, is, is the biggest adopter, perhaps? So what would you say to that? Um, I think, well, I think just the nature of our business, we support a lot of technology and software organizations. So companies that are, de you know, deploying these channel partner or value added reseller networks um, to, to essentially just train these partners on their product so that they can sell, uh, sell it as effectively and to the level that these different companies expect um, their partners to sell them to. Um, we see a lot of manufacturing uh, and even telecom too. Um, I think COVID, especially in the pandemic, has just um, has brought a lot of different kind of uh, expectations around how to how to manage those partners. It's not just about making sure that people know about the product or how to install it. It's also, you know, what are some of the processes uh, we want to make sure that our distributors or our, our installers or uh, field service reps uh, from from those third parties. Um, are following to make sure that they're best representing the brand. Um, mm -hmm. I think telecom might even be a you know a perfect example of that, where um, you know nowadays with people working more at home, you know there is a push to make sure that everyone has you know really high quality connectivity. Um, so you know the process change around you know related more so related to health and safety and making sure that you know we're kind of sticking to the checklist of of representing the brand as best possible, but providing the best experience to the customer as well through mm -hmm. those third party networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I think Go ahead. Sorry, I was just I was just going to add John I think please. that I think that um, you know it's not a question of whether these industries have partners or not it's 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 about you know how many do they have because they they all have it in one way or another and to echo Matt's point just around you know the the pandemic and in covid if you think if this the the need um for how fast information needed to disseminate throughout the healthcare industry with related to the virus itself or PPE or the availability or where to get it or the processes, the procedures, it, it you know, faster is better. And how, how do we, how do we do that? It, it's, it's not going to be, you know, um, sent, sending out, out paper to do it. It's a, it's a process we're going to want to manage and monitor and update. And mm -hmm. and you just you, it's not it's it's forever impacted us in that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, even before that, uh, though, that's a good point uh, for sure. But even before that, channel partners or or channel managers that or partner managers of any of those types that we discuss tend to have a common set of of challenges that are in a lot of cases different than what employee L and D uh, folks are used to from a, a challenge standpoint. Uh, Craig, you got 20 years in this. Tell us about what those common goals or challenges it, are across. Well, yeah. So, so, so the biggest, the biggest challenges our partners don't work for us, right? So, <laughs> so it's pretty hard to make them do anything. Uh, and I think that speaks to to something we get into a later on about the quality of the content and things that that we need to deliver. But, you know, I I, I touched on on compliance a, a little bit earlier. Um, I, I will I will just to give some credence to the value of effectively training your partners. I used to work for a really large technology organization, and we literally had the, the market leading solution, and and we would lose partners all the time to a to to what what everybody knew was a was was not a, was a solution that wasn't robust as what we were offering in the market. And I would constantly ask those partners, you know, why 
why are you leaving us? Why are you going somewhere else? And they would, they would say, well, the other organization may not have the robust technology, but they're providing the training and education to be, be effective. So that the value that, that partners are placing on it is high, really high, higher than we absolutely realize. Um, but just to kind of, you know, continue on here with the points on your slide, I think it's, you know, all, all these things. And, and on, on top of that, the ability to, to do some internal reflection on the data that we gleam out of delivering the training is really, really important as well. You know, we want them to be self-sufficient. We want them to have access to the data that they need, the information that they need on product training and everything else. Because if we don't give it to them in this manner, it turns into phone calls and emails, which isn't scalable. So if you're an organization looking to scale, it gets even more critical that you have a strong manner in, in which to do that. And and it's about setting up these programs prior and not after you get get into it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've, in my experience, I, I, the one that seems to rise to the top uh, with the, the buyers uh, that I've been working with is that they're really worried about their brand because, uh, you know, they the partners are the representation of the brand in the marketplace. So not having them as sharp, as smart, as helpful, as responsive or better than your internal employees that do the same function is a dilution of your brand strength. And so organizations you know, really care about uh, making sure that uh, their partners do it the right way. And partners, in my experience, uh, especially sales partners, and I'm a recovering sales guy, so I, I know this for sure, there are partners that are motivated by, uh, by commission and by sales. And they're gonna sell whatever product is the easiest for them to sell in the moment. And so if you provide your partners with the right education tools uh, of all sorts, they're gonna be prepared in, in the heat of the moment, in the heat of that sales moment, and they're gonna tend to use your, your solution more. And so just those two things alone uh, seem to, to really rise to the top of my clients. And, but I ask all my clients and I ask everybody that I interview, you know, what, you know, what are the measurable benefits that they are uh, seeing or that they're measured to or the solution or the problem or behavior that they're trying to change in a measurable way. And generally, I can group what folks tell me, uh, experts tell me into, into these three buckets. Either they wanna increase revenue. So uh, a big challenge uh, for all, uh, the whole reason you have a sales channel, uh, sales partners in the first place is that you want to scale sales in a way that you can't do with just your internal employees. And so, for each partner, you know, you want to first onboard them, but then you want to turn them into a high performer. And so just having a partner that sells a million when you want them to sell 10 million uh, isn't good enough. So it's that increase in partner sales. It's identifying the top partners and really working with them and understanding why and how they're doing it to, to be able to drive more revenue. Or it's from a save uh, money aspect. So, you know, a lot of organizations, uh, are on the reactive side of the emails and the phone calls Craig was describing. And, you know, it runs up costs and decreases uh, efficiency uh, and and that costs money. And then also in the, the age of of, uh, of the pandemic here, just the reduction, even pre-pandemic, but, but it was the reduction of travel costs and brick and mortar and sending trainers, you know, on site, you know, with your products, trying to reduce that uh, and to save money there. But the most uh, progressive ones uh, take it past that and organizations, and they really think about the improvement of their business processes, of how, how they can decrease time to either onboard a new partner or, or uh, release a new product or a new service out in, into the marketplace. Uh, but just taking it from a, a product release cycle, which has a shelf life, every product has a shelf life. If it normally takes you 90 days uh, to roll that out across the world and you can you know shorten that to 45 days and you have an extra 45 days essentially till your competitors uh, catch up in, into the marketplace and so you can use it to uh, incrementally improve the the business in, in general and so uh, from a subsidiary standpoint or rolling out and and trying to do that efficiently uh, i think matt's got a good story 
Yeah, yeah, we've uh, we've had some really successful customers do some very, really great, really great things with in their partner training world. And I'm sure if anyone's done any renovations around their house or, or tiled their backsplash or redone their shower, Craig, Craig. They've, they've used some yeah. kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah, Craig, <laughs> they've, they've used a Mapei product at some point. Um, so Mapei is one of our customers. Um, but they, they're a really interesting use case in the sense that, you know, like many other companies, they started their learning initiatives for, for internal audiences only, but recognized that as the company was growing and expanding globally, there was a huge opportunity to start to train um, their partners and distributors and, and, and applicators and installers. So um, the interesting thing that I, that I find with, with MAPE is that they've been, able to, um, they've been able to identify ways to establish different domains um, across um, different subsidiaries, but also different uh, geographies, essentially. So um, they've been able to expand that, that training program from just training um, 700 employees using Docebo to training 7,000 partners, customers, and employees through Docebo. Wow. Um, it's a really huge, uh, huge undertaking for the team, but um, you know, it just goes to show that you know, if you are able to find a scalable solution, um, and understand how you can use um, different use cases to support entry into new use cases. I think there's uh, the evidence there that it, you can you can expand and scale really really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, Give us three more, Matt. Three more. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I can't can't name the company unfortunately, but we do have a, a client that's a U.S. cybersecurity and data backup provider, um, and they got into the partner training world because. They were having issues related to numbers of support tickets um, that were overwhelming their support channels. So um, they recognized that, you know, quite frankly, there was just too many simple fixes that these customers could have solved themselves. But it 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 was the result of a lack of partner product knowledge. So they they essentially what they did was develop an incentivization strategy within their partner network to entice those partners into completing training across various uh, training and certification, I should say, across various products. Um, and, and incentivizing them with with different uh, rewards such as free shipping or market development funds to to push the product. Um, and I think the outcome there is that uh, the partner team now has better visibility into um, those partners who are struggling and may require a little bit more handholding. So they're able to identify uh, gaps uh, quickly, but also um, support people in a way that actually makes them successful more often. Um, and it's 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 interesting. A little incentivization can go a long way. Um, iGel is another customer of ours that's uh, solely a partner uh, partner uh, revenue operation, so no internal sales, it's all partner partner network. Um, but I think the really interesting uh, thing that iGel does is that they tie partner relationship strength and commitment to the level of training that their partners are completing. So they have you know different courses and certifications along that partner life cycle that we're going to get into a little bit uh, in a little bit here. Um, as a way to just, and they basically incentivize um, these different courses and, and certifications uh, on a commission basis. So the more that you complete, the more expert you become in their product and how you can uh, sell it and make your make their customers successful, the higher your commissions will be for sale. So it's really interesting way of, of not only um, bringing new, new partners into their world, but also, you know, giving them a way to um, look forward to staying and maintaining and developing that relationship over time. Uh, I think that's a really, really, uh, really interesting way of looking at it. Um, and then we have Walmart as well, which is kind of a, a very different application, but but Walmart is using Docebo to train 40,000 of their Walmart Marketplace partner community. So Walmart, uh, the, the Walmart Marketplace is essentially um, an Amazon-like marketplace where, where uh, suppliers can sell their products directly through an e-commerce platform that Walmart hosts. Um, so basically, um, Walmart's using that platform um, to deliver training that focuses on building uh, their business to get the most out of selling through that Walmart marketplace. So Walmart is using the platform, or using Docebo, I should say, to, to foster those relationships with those suppliers and those partners um, so that they're successful with the platform, which in turn makes uh, the Walmart marketplace very successful. Um, awesome. So yeah, some really, really great stories with that. Good stories, good stories. All right, partner life cycle. So where are you guys at? Speaking of life cycle, let's ask the audience real quick. Let me launch this. And there we go. And uh, so which of the best described your organization's channel training efforts? Uh, you don't provide training to any type of partners right now or that you know of? Uh, you're planning to? So maybe you're, that's part of your new audiences from the first poll here that 
you're being asked to reach out to. Um, we provide training and info, like on a website or SharePoint, but not with an LMS. You know, we don't really track individuals. Uh, we don't provide actual formal training, more of information. Or we use a standalone LMS for our partners. Or we use the internal employee LMS. Let's go ahead and uh, answer that to see where everybody's at here. Um, we got about half of you, 60% voted, 70%, three, two, one. All right, we'll close it. Take a look at this guy's audience. So we got 25% don't provide it. So um, hopefully today's giving you a, a good uh, foundation of, of what you're going to need. 25% uh, provide training info, uh, but no LMS. And I tell you what, I, that, that seems light to me. I run into that scenario probably more than than anything uh, because organizations have been doing that for a long time, uh, providing that information. Uh, we use a standalone uh, core 25% of you, uh, which we'll talk about in just a second. And 17% uh, uh, use their internal employee uh, to reach out uh, for that, uh, which is uh, the second main path or the first main path that you could use to uh, for channel learning. So uh, interesting mix. Uh, we got everybody all over the board here. Um, and uh, for the sake of time, guys, I'm going to move on here without uh, commenting on that for me to get to the partner life cycle. So this is an interesting way uh, that I think that you can think about the value that you can provide uh, the partner organizations from an L&D standpoint. Um, this is where we can impact partners. And so um, when you think about a partner, it's almost just like a customer in some sense that you have to attract them, you have to bring them on, you know, onboard them, you have to you know, support them over time and, and eventually turn them into an advocate. And with partners, it's, I, you know, it's essentially identical, but you're doing it uh, with groups of people. And so uh, the most progressive organizations uh, from a learning standpoint think about how they can use training to change behavior and improve those, make money, save money, improve business metrics in each one of these categories, uh, because that's an easy way uh, to uh, to really maximize your value. And so uh, real quickly, let's, let's run around the horn. Uh, Craig, tell us about Attract. Give us an idea about how you'd use uh, from an Attract standpoint. Yeah, I, I mean, my first comment on partner life cycle is don't ever think you're done training partners. So that's part of the mistake. It's never done. It's an ongoing, an ongoing exercise that you're going to have to engage in, you know, drawing the parallel to you're, you're really not done training your employees either. So they're an extension of you, you know, so in a lot of ways, it's it's um, it, it can be closer than certain customer relationships. Um, but, you know, for attracting partners, the number one thing that I've been told by partners that have read in study after study is that. The good partners, the partners that you want, will be critical of your onboarding process. So in, in itself, your your process your process for educating partners, bringing them up to speed, continuing to provide them with education, is that you have that in place. So so to attract partners, r r real important. It, it 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 ranks higher than than margin if you can believe it. I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. Sure. Um, you know, you're investing in their success when you invest in these. So, so not only that, you can actually leverage the technology to screen partners. Um, you know, putting putting them through an early an early pace to see how well they they acclimate to your product and your market and your organization. If they've got the capabilities to do it, I mean, I know we all probably use scorecards, but definitely what you can pull out of a, out of a, a you know a a learning platform will give you the ability to have, to impact that will have a, an ability to impact that scorecard so so it 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 plays a role in attraction from a number of perspectives yeah without a doubt when you think uh, even like if you're buying into a franchise you know one of the things that you really want to worry about as that new franchise e uh you know before you purchase is you know what kind of support they're going to give you how are they going to onboard you how are they going to make you successful you know, how yep. do they do they treat those partners? So it tends to be one of the the, the primary things that, uh, as you said, smart partners, the partners that you want evaluate. But once you get them and you you attract them, you know you have to onboard them. And just like a customer, 
it's a similar goal. Uh, you want to onboard them and get them to competency in the shortest amount of time possible. So you want to, you know, organizations, you know, are creating, uh, depending on the type of partner and your partner might have different roles in it. So, you know, for example, a partner might be a, a value added reseller that, you know, has to sell your products and services, but then it also has to implement your products and services. So you might have different types of roles. And for each one of those roles, uh, the ability to have a learning journey uh, that uh, takes you through the learning that you need in a systematic way to get up to competency and whatever that role is and what they want you to do. And so uh, by far, this is the table stakes. This is if you're going into channel and, and partner training, uh, I would say 90% of the time, it's the onboarding is the, is the first uh, piece that you developed. And then once you get them successful uh, or get them ramped up successfully, at least at that point in time, then you enter into the support phase. And Craig, how should we think about that? Yeah, I mean, it, if you just think of it, you know, from a practicality standpoint, um, if a partner has a, an urgent scenario where they need to understand something, whether it's a sale or how to do something, um, there's two ways you can go about it. You can either have a facility for them to be educated ahead of time, access the information when they need it, so at the time of need, mm -hmm. or you know you can wait. They happen to be in another time zone, and they can wait till somebody wakes up in the morning to get to answer a phone call or an email. And you know it's that key that the, the key need that we have in our organizations to deliver information in a timely manner. Um, you know, and support various cycles that they may be in on a number of subjects. It's about timeliness. And and if we can't do that, we're going to be ineffective. We're going to work, hit swirl. We're going to have all kinds of things happen. And, um, you know, being able to, and, and, and though the way we have the life cycle drawn here, support is going to be your, your ongoing, never ending, you know, uh, aspect of this relationship that you're you're going to to need to do well and continue to do well especially if you you know we don't invest in partnerships lightly anymore organizationally at Docebo we we kind of cut to the chase really quickly is is this something that's going to work we're making an investment they're making an investment and it's going to be cyclical and that's where the relationship stays in that phase for for years and years potentially so mm -hmm. um it is absolutely, absolutely necessary to a successful relationship. Yeah, and just the in customer learning, we talk about the, the concept of churn, and it's identical here too. The the cost to attract and train and ramp up a new partner is is significant, and yes. uh, to have those partners uh, leave uh, in the support phase because you're not supporting them is is much more costly than it appear, appears at first blush in terms yeah. of all the investment that you made previously and then really uh, all you know, that going forward production that you're you're forfeiting is uh, well outpaces even for just a handful of partners well outpaces the cost of partner education yeah our our partners our partners aren't taking it lightly and and they're making an investment too nobody wants to get into these relationships and have them turn in six months yeah. nobody wants to be there you know not not you not not your partner and you know that goes with any type of partner so let's not just think about our, our channel our sales partners in this think about the struggle you would go through you know if a key critical supplier of environmental services decides to to blow town, right? What 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 do you do? It, it's it's just something that you you need to be thinking about with any organizations that, that any organization that's touching you from an operational perspective. Yeah, no doubt. Well, if you do a really good job on uh, the supporting side of your business, one, you're going to achieve all those measurable results. But uh, two, that we talked about, or whatever ones you're that you're targeting. Uh, but two, you're going to turn your best partners into advocates, and this is what uh, folks forget about a lot is this stage because you got to be you got to be really good to get to this stage uh, as it turns out matt what's it mean well i think it's you know getting them to do stuff like this <laughs> getting them to join you in marketing activities i think the goal here you know getting them through the onboarding support phase should be to try to get them as close to that the mothership as possible right 
to develop that relationship in a way that you've supported them so much that they are going to champion not only the product because they love selling that product, but they're going to champion the company because you've um, committed to developing a relationship with them that is designed to last. It's not like Craig said, we don't, no one wants these things to churn in six months. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's as much providing value as it, as it is um, using that, using those different functionalities, whether it's learning, training, support, marketing, whatever, um, but to build those relationships necessary to keep those people um, around so that they start to champion, like I said, not only the product, but the business. Um, yeah. And then you're using them to, to, you know, including them in the development of, of, of new partner, um, new partner activities, whether it's reference calls, webinars, marketing materials, et cetera. You're creating such a demand for your product that these guys can't get enough and, and never tire of selling. And I think that's, um, that's really important. Yeah, just think of it as the just the incremental, the incremental power of that as you get, you know, each and every partner to the point where they're they're so close to the mothership that they're doing the things that you say. Just the the expansive scalability that would just be impossible uh, with with your normal methods, and hence the whole idea of of why you would have partners uh, to begin with. So, what do you need from? You know, we're gonna go ahead and skip uh, uh, that just in, in lieu of time and get you know, what do you need from a a technology standpoint, so your LMS. Um, so we talked about, you know, 25% of you are, are using your website uh, or, or some mechanism to, you know, provide the the, the information, uh, which is a great first step. Um, you know, the next step then is to, you know, get to those audiences, those defined audiences, and creating, for example, those onboarding journeys. So it's not just a matter of like searching through help or you know getting available presentations, but What's that guided uh, step look like to to turn them uh, into into uh, successful onboarding and all the way to the the advocate phase? And to do that, you need a learning management system. And a learning management system, as you know, manages content and learners and the interrelationship uh, between the two. And once you know who those content content consumed and the learners, well, that's the beginning or the basis of your measurable business case because you can uh, then see you know learners. Uh, partners that have engaged in those certification paths versus those that didn't. And you can just see how they perform, the change in performance, and measure that over time. And you can't do that unless you have some sort of learning management system. And so with a learning management system, you really have you really have two paths with, with channel learning. Your one path, and we've talked a lot about that today, is and it's probably the easiest path, is you have an existing employee learning management system, and you open that up to your different partner groups one at a time or over a strategic rollout and you know why wouldn't everybody do that well maybe your lms can't handle it maybe it doesn't have the right features and we'll talk about that in just a second of kind of the incremental feature set that you would need to do that so organizations first look and they say okay well can i use my internal employee lms to do this and so you compare the features that you need compared to what you have and you get to uh, you know a different uh, conclusion of yes or no. If the answer is no, then a lot of times organizations uh, you know go to you know the second step, which is uh, which 25% of the attendees here did, which is to go for a dedicated learning management system for their channel partners. Guess what path is right? Both, they're both right. Uh, it all depends on where you're at right now and to be nimble. If you don't have the right employee LMS that gives you the capabilities to expand, the answer is not ignoring your channel. The answer is standing up a separate one and trying to do that in a cost-effective way. And in a lot of ways, to do the, the second path is, is somewhat easier because uh, you know there's less people involved, less uh, cooks in the kitchen on, on uh, setting it up, uh, not having L&D. But some of the cons on doing that is for your organization is that you might have different types of partners that are all doing the same thing. So it could be two times or three times or four times the, the sales cost, the implementation cost, and most importantly, the content cost. So in my experience, when I see the two different LMSs, there's a lack of sharing of content, uh, either practically or politically or fiscally. I'm not quite sure what the, uh, the key driver is, but there's a lack of sharing. But if you go down path one, then organizations get more economies of scale out of their content. Because think about it, any of the sales and service content that you would have to train your own people is is 80 to 90 to 100% of what you would have to train your partners in. 
So, you know, having that right content and being able to share that allows you to open up the partners faster and provide them content faster where path two, where it may seem like it's a little faster, isn't. But either path is right. The key thing is to figure out if you have an employee LMS, can it do it? And if not, it's two. If you're on this call right now and you have nothing to do with employee LMS and you were thinking about going down path two, that's also right. Uh, so uh, you can't go wrong in this. Uh, you can't go wrong in this. But what you don't want to do is have an LMS. You can go wrong. You don't want to have an LMS that's capable of do it. And then let and through lack of outreach to your partners, the partner groups in your organization, through lack of outreach, allow them to go down path two on their own and then have your company pay the price, your organization through all the multiple technologies, multiple contracts, um, you know, multiple skill sets that, that are required. That's the wrong path is having the capable uh, LMS and then not using it. So how do you know uh, what's capable? What, what exactly uh, does that mean? And it would be things like having partner areas where your partners would have, the administrators would have some administrative control over their learners and they could see their learners and their content paths, uh, have good reporting and analytics about what's going on in their group. In some cases, there's e-commerce and uh, the purchasing of, uh, of, of content uh, inside of there. There's also, uh, there's also uh, centralized content management like we talked about. So being able to have a, the content in one place and use it for learning journeys for your employees and learning journeys for your your partners the overall as craig said before we can't tell these folks what to do or our partners so the learning experience has to be super top notch easy you know not frustrating um it has to be you know modern and awesome you have to have mobile capabilities to support these uh, uh customers on the run a lot of times integrated social and like ask the expert functionality and uh, gamification and uh, so forth uh, are are things that you don't necessarily need all 10 of these, uh, but these are the things that you need to be able to uh, spin off. And so uh, in, in the interest of time, Matt, what's your, what would you say is the most important one out of all of these? Um, well, I, I, I would say that, you know, centralizing that content management and tying it in and understanding, you know, the reporting features you need, but also the analytics that you can measure to actually measure the success of these programs is critically important. But I also add that, you know, there's there's one that might be missing here in the sense of um, the ability to create multiple domains for different partners so that you can customize that experience for them. Um, you know, it's very similar to creating different different portals or domains for for customers in that education space. But but I mean, you know, I think just really quickly, you know. Like you said, John, about the fact that if you're, you know, training your sales your salespeople through your employee LMS, you know, if you have a solution that's um, that supports both sides of that internal and external coin, you're you're already ahead because you've already got the content. It becomes more about a curation uh, exercise rather than a creative exercise, right? So mm -hmm. it makes deployment quite quite simple, and quite easy. Yep. Yep. Okay. I I buy that. We're gonna uh, we, we talked about these folks before, so I'm gonna jump over yeah. them. Matt, just make sure that we get to these last critical slides. PRM, this is the one thing that's so different in uh, a partner uh, system or partner uh, solutions than it is in uh, employee systems. Uh, Craig, summarize real quickly for us what a PRM is and, and why that's important to know. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time looking at, at PRM systems and certainly they're, they're important for two, two reasons. One is, if it gives, you know, if it, if it has the ability to manage your partner's sales cycle, so to speak. So, you know, if I'm on a recruitment mode, um, in in much the manner a CRM helps you you understand your customers. Um, the other thing it does is it helps you, um, it helps you with the operational aspect of these relationships. So, if you need, you know, a technology to deliver content to partners or you know manage any payment processes or uploads or what have you it can play a critical role in that um, and really which one you work with depends on on what your partner makeup looks like and what they do for you um, they tend to be very uh, sales centric um, mm -hmm. but um, you know you 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 can certainly make use of them in a, in a lot of different ways and and some of the new breed ones are really great and I've looked at them, uh, looked at them recently, and it's just kind of about that scale as to whether or not it's it's effective for you. 
but yeah. yeah, certainly all those things that you have there critical because you're you're operationally disconnected from your partner and you need a way to do that to be timely. There's yep. just no question. So how does that fold into this conversation? It folds in through that the PRM needs to be integrated with the LMS. And so you know what that looks like is that the PRM or the channel partner network certainly around that sales aspect is is already established in your organization because that's the first step of your channel is the is that sales distribution and so that partner in ecosystem is there and so the the tricky part about expanding out into that is identifying that ecosystem and what would be the integrations required to the LMS to fit the LMS into that ecosystem versus try to take the assumption that they're going to throw out their channel ecosystem and you know we're going to do it all with the learning management system so it's really it, it's helpful and insightful to be able to go in there and understand. So every PRM is different. The modules which a company deploys in a PRM are different. So it's important for anybody that's deploying a learning management system to understand what your PRM does, what are the different pieces of it, and are they going to be incremental to what the employee does? So for example, the employee gets their user data from the Workday or SAP or the ERP or HRM system. Well, the partner get the partner data from the PRM. Employees are gonna log in single sign-on, partner's gonna log in with a different single sign-on. So it's a lot of the same integrations that you might be used to, but you're gonna to have to do them in duplication uh, for the different partners. So that's uh, a lot of times where LMSs uh, fall down, like supporting, uh, for example, two different single sign-on methods for two different audiences is something that really cripples a lot of, uh, a lot of audiences. So you have the LMS, you go down path one, you go down path two, uh, it doesn't matter, you get, get to the same content needs analysis. And even though we'll go quickly through this, we've covered all this today in, in kind of other parts, but we want to identify who our audiences are, who are those partners, no matter what name they go by, and are there different types of roles inside a particular partner? What behavior do we want to change with these, uh, you know, with, with our training? What is something that we can measure? How are we going to tie that back for each audience to a measurable business case that we can see whether our efforts are, are working or not. And that behavioral change, do we have the content to support that in any type of content that's needed? So doing that audit of looking at your employee content and seeing what can be used and repurposed is a quick, easy four-step process to go through and get you to that 80 or 90% of the content that has to be applicable to, to both internal and external audiences. And where that leads you to then is to for creating the new content of how do you create that new content uh, quickly and rapidly. So uh, this whole process of reaching out to your partners doesn't take a year, but takes weeks or months. And so that could be like live or virtual meetings that you then record and turn on to on demand. It could be assembling assets of different pieces inside the learning management system or quick and easy videos or wrapping everything uh, in, into uh, training plans, uh, uh, for example. So the ability, uh, Matt, Matt, why don't you comment on that real quick about that training plan? So I know you wanted to make a good point here. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an extension of the comment I made earlier just about the fact that, you know, I think now a lot of companies are in a position where um, the, the ability to essentially curate these different types of content rather than create them from scratch is, is quite significant. And, but it also lends itself really well to a more blended learning environment for, for every audience in a, in a way because um you know obviously there's a need for for uh, virtual ilt but you know you can't do ilt anymore so you need ways to support those virtual instructor-led sessions with other types of content whether that's prep, uh, content to prepare someone for the session or supplementary content afterwards but um i do think that you know i think we're seeing more of a trend towards a, a bigger focus on that blended learning component um, and even self-guided or self-paced um, afterwards, just by providing people with an avenue to do that, um, it's a great way to develop the relationship. But but um, just just having access is is enough um, for many people to to show that commitment, right? No doubt, no doubt. All right, well, just like we planned, we're running right into the hour uh, in our last minute here. Uh, but what we talked about today is it's about business sustainability. You don't have time to wait for the partner organizations to come to you now. You got to go out there and find them if you're in the internal. Uh, training and development folks and help save your company or help 
uh, improve your company here through so proactive intervention uh, with training. But either whether you're coming from L&D or you're coming from the business unit, uh, specifically with the partner, it all starts with the me measurable business case. It all starts with leveraging the right content. So even if you are doing it independently, that doesn't mean you shouldn't go back to your internal employees and figure out what content that you can use and share. Don't create it from scratch. And uh, just remember that with uh, channel learning, you need to join the LMS, needs to join that ecosystem rather than trying to be the ecosystem. So in this case, I know we always want to be the center of the universe, uh, but in this case, really think about that that universe already exists and how you can fit in. But now's the time to act. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, coming in. There is questions. We're going to have to follow up individually. Send me an email, johnlayatalentedlearning.com uh, with any questions, comments, feedback from the session. You see Matt and uh, Craig's email addresses. You can reach directly out to them. You uh, contact me for CAE credit. So uh, Matt Powell, uh, Craig Gleason, thanks very much for joining me today, sharing your wisdom.